Voilà, voilà. Um, if you agree, we will immediately run into the last session, the panel discussion, with again uh, very relevant issues to be debated, to be discussed. What I would propose is that we will first give the floor to, to Stan, Professor Schmidt, uh, raising a couple of, of issues, of questions uh, already um, sent to the four speakers in advance. And then we will invite the panelists to give uh, short or less short answers, but uh, within 10 minutes, uh, seven minutes, 10 minutes, and then it's up to the audience to come into the debate with, with the panelists before the final, final closing uh, session. Voila, Stan. Thank you, Jan. And let me also introduce our panelists to everybody in the room and uh, following us online. So we've heard from Sir Malcolm Evans before, but just as a reminder, he's a professor of public international law at the University of Bristol. We have uh, Miriam hunter Hennin, who is a professor of comparative law and law and religion at University College London. Uh, Wim van der Donk, who is a uh, rector magnificus of Tilburg University and also president of the board of executive uh, of his university, uh, and besides full professor of public administration at Tilburg University. And Kurt Willems, who is an associate professor of public law at the University of Leuven, where he coordinates the Center for Public Law. He also chairs the Inter-University Center for Education Law, uh, a co-organizer uh, of this event. So we, we have indeed prepared a few questions for you. Um, I will field uh, perhaps three of them. I'll, I'll give them all three and it's up to you to decide which question you feel like taking on. Uh, we'll then go probably in the reverse order uh, back to me and then afterwards we'll have room for questions from the audience. Um, so the first question relates to who is best placed, you believe, uh, to interpret the principle of neutrality. So several speakers today have highlighted uh, that the supranational courts at the European level exercise judicial restraint when they interpret the requirements of neutrality. Uh, and at least some national courts do that as well, while other national courts, uh, such as the Constitutional Court of Germany, which we've heard from, uh, give their own interpretation of the requirements of neutrality. And our question to you as a panel is, who do you consider and why do you consider that actor to be best placed to interpret this rather vague requirement of neutrality, considering the implications that it has for freedom of religion? Is it the legislature because it is the democratic elected body and has that democratic mandate? Or it's supranational courts because the interpretation of neutrality has implications for the human right to freedom of religion? Or are it perhaps national courts who are better attuned to for instances like constitutional identity at the domestic level? Or is it rather the case that it's more uh, relevant to leave these decisions to local decision makers, to local public institutions and private businesses, because they are better placed to assess the local needs? So you see there are multiple actors here to whom we could delegate this interpretive responsibility. And my broad question is, to whom do you think it's best uh, uh, directed? A second question, and I'm fielding three just to give you some room to decide which question you feel like taking on, uh, concerns the role of neutrality in the regulation of teaching on religion and teaching about religion in public schools. Uh, so the question is relatively brief. Is neutrality really the right principle to consider here? We've heard some presentations that indicated it might not be. Is perhaps the principle of pluralism more relevant or yet an alternative principle? So in essence, how should we engage with teaching on and teaching about religion in public schools and what is the potential role of neutrality? A third question uh, concerns the, a recurring argument made by several speakers today, perhaps most emphatically by uh, Professor Nussberger, that insistence on neutrality effectively encourages or necessitates persons to conceal their religious convictions. Uh, and the question is relatively simple. Is this in all circumstances problematic? Is such concealing always problematic or could it perhaps also be necessary or at least advisable in some settings? So these are our three questions to start off the debate and I'm sure you will also be reacting uh, one to another uh, and we'll see how the debate develops from there. So um, Jan, maybe you want to regulate from now yeah, on. Just add add one, one uh, particular issue, namely is it, is pluralism, neutrality, secularism one overall notion, or can he articulate it specifically to one or more specific domains? 
for instance, education, is that completely the same um, articulation of secularism, neutrality in schools as in prisons, in hospitals, in the army, or in public service, for instance? Um, that, that could be a fourth, fourth issue. Professor Van der Donk, Rector Magnificus. Just because the two raise hand on the screen and now back to the microphone again. Well, thank you so much for all the questions because audience, you might not know, we had 10 questions prepared. <laughs> um, and I already said to Stein, what a rich conference this is. And, and it's rightfully so because I think this is, you know, I come from a university landscape in the Netherlands where many people are now stressing the necessity to invest in technology because that's the future of society. I would say, don't forget law, human oria, social sciences, because this is, I think it was a colleague Pirik who talked about the gestalt switch in society. And this kind of research and questions are needed to prepare for a peaceful, pluralistic society. So it's very, very important subject and it's so rich. And I think it was Colleague Vermeer who said he had to digest all the papers and the issues. That's for me exactly the same. And to stay in the gastronomic metaphor, this conference is a kind of marinade <laughs> that, that will go on for long, I would say. So many, many issues and questions. Um, but if you ask me to whom I would trust the issues of neutrality, after this conference, it would be completely impossible to answer that question in a way that is just one institution, because what this conference has shown is that it is remaining an essentially contested concept, which are the most interesting concepts, scientifically speaking, but for the practice of policy making and those who have to take decisions, I think it's even becoming more difficult. But this conference, on the other hand, I think showed us that you can talk in such a way that, well, there is a kind of typology looming, a typology of issues. Jan, it might be uh, referring to specific sectors, healthcare, education, because neutrality in the one sector is perhaps differently to be treated differently than in another one, because it depends, it depends, it depends, because I never uh, would say that we can after this, we could not, we, we didn't. We weren't able to do that before the conference either, but the conference has shown that we have to elaborate the concept and it's a kind of overlapping concept. It's, you know, the question is under what conditions um, we could talk about neutrality. What is that? And even is, is neutrality of the state a different kind of neutrality than another kind of neutrality? So as a good conference, more questions are popping up, but to to conclude, my first reaction to you is my contention would be that it would be very dangerous in such a change of times where the Gestalt switch is still taking shape to confine or to uh, make responsible for these difficult questions just one institution. And the second, and I think that Professor De Smet was hinting at it this morning, I would say that the learning process in which we have to learn again, pluralism, objectivity, neutrality, and so on, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a changing societal context, I would prefer the local, the regional, above the national and the international, not as a complete um, antagonism, but I think for the learning experience, we should not uh, go away too much from where it happens in the midst of society, in the midst of societal domains, in complex organizations. Of course, and that's my last point, because uh, talking too long is not necessary, I would say. I think it's, in the end of the day, it will be like Amitai Etzioni always called the kind of mixed scanning. It will be concrete practices, local uh, decision makers, local courts, and of course the international ones. It, with, it You have to organize a, a process of mixed scanning, which in a way, of course, is already there in the legal field. Um, let me stop here for this moment. Thank you very much for this uh, possibility to, to give some thoughts on, on a very interesting conference so far, uh, which very much which 
insights. Uh, I'm not sure which questions to choose since they're all very interesting. Um, I think I'll talk about the second one, uh, teaching on and about religion, um, since that's what I'm teaching also at university. But perhaps first something on, on neutrality as a concept, since if we're asking um, who's best suited to interpret neutrality, then um, which neutrality are we talking about? And I do uh, agree with uh, the first speaker here that it's an, a, a contested concept, but also a concept that might mean something different in different fields and different levels, um, which is okay, I think. I mean, there are certain core ingredients um, in neutrality and since there are certain core ingredients or aims of neutrality we quickly think well there must be um, a derivative right, right or something that might not even exist neutrality or a means to an end um, like equal treatment like non-discrimination like impartiality um, access to justice and fair access to justice all, all can be seen as part and minimal content of neutrality but I think there's something else there as well, um, and that's where the different levels play up. And uh, I see neutrality as being able to make your own specific blend um, of the type of uh, society you want, meaning it's closely linked to identity, it's closely linked to organization, and you can have neutrality um, in the way that a state thinks of neutrality, uh, and there's different way of thinking of neutrality as we've seen today. I mean, um, exclusive neutrality, inclusive neutrality, one state religion, but with um, sufficient uh, accommodation towards other religions, specific engagement with recognized religions instead of having one um, state religion. There are different way of thinking which type of state do I want to be? What is my specific blend? Um, and I'd say the same goes for schools. Schools can have their own idea. Um, their own specific blend of neutrality since for them neutrality is very closely linked to their pedagogical concept to the way they want to teach to the way they want to discipline their students which um, participation of students there will be in the school boards so you can have neutrality and the way you make you you want to make your own specific blend of it at the government level but you can also have um, your own specific blend at the uh, at the school board level so i'd say there's different concepts of neutrality and having a plurality in neutrality concepts i have no preference over the one or the other but uh, i'm not saying that having a plurality in neutrality concept is necessarily worse than having one uniform pluralist interpretation of neutrality um so that's plurality versus pluralism uh, there um so since there's different concepts of neutrality for me at different levels I'm not going to say that there's one necessary interpreter necessary interpreter of neutrality uh, but I wanted to talk about the second point which is the teaching on or teaching about religion um, well and, and there I perhaps want to to some way defend what the court did in Lao Tzu too um, if you talk if you're looking at the case law the European Court of Human Rights under Article 2, then you notice that it differs from what it does under Article 9. Um, when, when you look at uh, the case law under Article 2, then basically they say, well, there needs to be um, visibility because the mere fact that something might be difficult for some from where they come for their convictions their religious beliefs their philosophical beliefs the mere fact that something might be difficult for them does not give them a right to ask not to be confronted with this issue because if you would do that then you could talk about none of the things that matter in schools so visibility is okay under article 2 that is a substantive approach and if um reframed from framing that in, in terms of neutrality. They stayed away from neutrality. They said uh, critical, objective, and pluralistic. That is substantive, plurales, pluralistic. That's something else than neutrality uh, under Article 9, I'd say. Um, and the, the reason why they chose pluralistic is because they want to give visibility to different to difficult ideas. And the idea of, okay, if it's difficult, then we'll leave it out of the school curricula that's something that will, will not work if you want to have qualitative education. So visibility is okay under Article 2. And then under um, Mansu Yeltsin and Zengin and Volgeroy, they, they moved a bit further than that. It's not only visibility that is okay, 
it's also predominant visibility that is okay, if that makes sense in a historic and cultural context. Because if you want to meaningfully engage with your students, then you need to take their culture and their society into account. You cannot just have an abstract curriculum, curriculum and then copy paste it from one country to the other. So predominant uh, visibility um, is okay under Article 2. So quantitatively, there's not an issue. The issue is qualitatively. And there, um, I do agree with pro what Professor Ringelam said. It's the absence of preference that makes a difference qualitatively under Article 2. And that's what they do in Folgego. That's what they do in uh, the Zenkin cases. That's what, uh, that's what they do in uh, Mansour Yeltsin. They look at, is there a qualitative reason why um, this specific thing that is being talked about is not uh, results in something that is a preference. And a no-go for them was uh, going to religious practices, going to mass, uh, citing verses from the Quran, because that is qualitative. Then you engage in religious practice. So that's what they say on the Article 2. And that's very different from the approach on the Article 9, which goes to what's a leg legitimate aim and then the uh, proportionality sense is strict to. Uh, there's a different substantive approach on the Article 2. And that makes sense um, to think about that since we've talked about Lao Tse 2 as if it were an Article 9 case, but the court chose not to. They specifically chose, we will treat this as an Article 2 case because they moved on from curricula through Valsamis to activities in the school. And then um, in Lao Tse, they said, okay, and now we'll look at the way the classroom is dressed up and what hangs on the wall, and we'll treat it as an Article 2 case. And then they made the same reasoning that I just said. Is there visibility? Yes. Is there predominant visibility? Yes. Does that result in um, a certain preference? And there they say no, and you could say they make a wrong claim there. Um, but what they say is, okay, it's there. But what is also there is the fact that the pupils, pupils can wear religious clothing. What is also there is the fact that the girls wear headscarves. What is also there is that you can take optional courses in other religions. What is also there is the fact that the Ramadan is, uh, there's uh, festivities for Ramadan, Ramadan within the school. So absence of preference, and you could say they make a wrong assessment there, since hanging on the wall is not just hanging on the wall. If you choose to put something on the wall in a school, uh, like we discussed uh, during, the, uh, during the, uh, the lunch, you're actually teaching because you're not just hanging something on the wall in a classroom without trying to convey a me message. Uh, so you could say they make a wrong assessment, but I argue that is the assessment they make. When choosing to deal with it under Article 2, then the mere fact that there's no qualitative preference for them is pluralistic. And because it's pluralistic, it's allowed. So Lao Tse 2, when dealt with under Article 2, makes perfect sense. Parovi is inexcusable. That's just a mistake. Um, but Lao Tse 2 makes sense. And that leads me to the conclusion, do we need to treat um, religious clothing um, of pupils and of teachers under Article 2 as well? Because Ironically, those cases have always been dealt with under Article 9. And if you would deal with those cases under Article 2, and you would start from the presumption, you cannot ask not to be confronted with it, because then teaching would become impossible, perhaps those cases would be treated differently. So is there a difference under Article 9 and article, under Article 2? I'd say there is, and the choice to treat one case under one article or the other article um, is an important one, which just seems to happen without any uh, justification by the court. So I'll leave it at that. Interesting thought indeed. Uh, Sir Evans? Well, um, thank, thank you. Um, and I'm not going to choose one question, because if I did, it might seem as if I'm freezing Miriam out, because there are only three questions and four of us. Um, but I want to talk about all of them slightly because I think they all interrelate actually um, in, in certainly from the way that that, that I suppose I, I, I look at them. Um, and I think by the end of the day, it, it's, it's fairly clear and today in my own mind has confirmed what I thought 
what I've suspected of myself for a long time, and that's I don't like neutrality very much, um, you know, as a concept, or in some senses, even in these ways, as, a, as an idea. You know, let's face it, who, whoever knows anyone who, you know, as a young child says, you know, when I grow up, I want to be neutral. Um, you, you know, what, what is it designed to achieve trying to be neutral in relation to a situation, particularly if you are in the position, let us say, of a decision maker, call yourself a court, call yourself a legislature, um, call yourself a local decision making body or a regional decision making body. It's in the words decision making court judgment it's all about coming to a position and coming to a conclusion and so there is something somehow don't ask me to define it being accurate isn't my forte um, but there is something about the very idea of striving to achieve outcomes through the idea of neutrality that somehow just doesn't resonate terribly well when the entire point of going to these places is to get an outcome to get a resolution um, unless you see neutrality as a fundamental principle which as I've said in my paper and others have said around them it, it's not sure clear where or why that should actually be now in a sense that takes us on to the next question about is neutrality in education uh, really the right way to go well if by neutrality what we are really meaning is that we shouldn't be favoring one thing above another it's not what we are surely it's in your question the idea of pluralism is a better avenue to to at least embrace the idea of being inclusive about different worldviews, mindsets, understandings, etc. Because at least pluralism has got a positive overtone to it. It's embracing, it's inclusive. It should be welcoming of ideas where the idea of neutrality is one of more of a, of a freezing out, of a, of a vague form of hostility to something. Oh, we've got to be neutral in relation to that. Why? If these are things that should be embraced, should be learned, should be understood, why should we be neutral to them and present what we do about them against a neutral paradigm? We're not being neutral. Everything in the classroom that is presented is presented in a positive spirit because it is something that should be a subject of learning and understanding. And so I do think that pluralism in, is a better framing of, of this than uh, neutrality as such. And in a sense, that again goes if you like to the other question that you posed about does neutrality encourage the concealment of religious well again there's something about the language that i, I think it possibly does but it's not that it it conceals religious if you just say it's all neutral that itself to me suggests there's something else going on this vague veiled feeling and i use the word veiled deliberately at that point accidentally but deliberately now I come to think about it um, um, that there is something going on here that if somebody turns up in a space and they are wearing religious clothing it's not just because it's what they wear what's the agenda there is something hidden going on what does it mean that someone who is giving a visible representation of their religious beliefs is fulfilling this role fulfilling this function doing this thing what's going on well you know not all people who are shall we say wearing religious clothing are manifesting their religion in what they wear as they go about doing what they do are trying to do something illegitimate it may be that all they're trying to do is wear what they habitually wear. Um, now, that isn't the same, of, as you say, about placing powerful symbols in places where it can have that um, negative impact. But again, this language of neutrality, I think, does have this freezing um, um, should we say chilling impact on the debates around these things and rather than then embracing what we should be tussing, discussing the difficult questions that we need to be discussing it becomes too easy to use the language of neutrality to retreat from that debate or to freeze out that debate which then takes us to the final thing which I can be brief on where should those debates be happening for my money it is I think in line with you we should be starting with the local
because that's where the problems actually crystallize. That is where so often they can be solved by better understanding of what's going on, by the better framing in a particular context where a contestation has arisen about what a solution to that might look like. And what, if you want to use that word, what neutrality in a given situation looks like, which can look very different from one situation to another. You know, neutrality in the United Kingdom is going to look very different, as we were discussing over coffee, to neutrality in France. And that's fine, as long as we do not then try to extrapolate from that difference the idea that there is a problem because there isn't because if that is how the idea of what we are trying to grasp through that neutrality is understood and resolved within that community provided it is open for people to challenge that understanding if they believe it goes too far and trenches on their basic freedoms of religion then what's wrong with that thank you um uh, <laughs> I wish I could have come before you, Malcolm. <laughs> um, especially as, as uh, I'm, I must apologise because I'm, I'm sort of reacting on, on the spot uh, to, to those uh, very uh, interesting questions. Um, but who is best placed to um, construe the requirements of neutrality? Um, I, I think, of course, all depends on our underlying conception of democracy, but also on uh, our underlying conception of neutrality, because this question uh, might not be raised uh, if it weren't about neutrality or uh, and uh, religion. Um, so uh, I am not neutral myself. I, I have to confess that uh, I am guided uh, in my work by a certain conception of uh, de democracy. Uh, I think that underlying my approach is a conception of democracy as a discursive uh, exercise, um, uh, an inclusive and open-ended reason giving process. So it is uh, by definition not uh, limited to uh, the expression of uh, majoritarian uh, uh, representation in uh, parliament. So I am uh, uh, naturally drawn uh, towards uh, uh, giving, um, <clears throat> opening up uh, the uh, uh, debate, not to uh, only the legislature, but the courts and also uh, stakeholders at, at local level. Uh, but I'm all the more inclined to do so uh, because of what is at stake uh, behind uh, uh, neutrality. I think that if we ask the question in relation to uh, neutrality in particular, it's because we want to sort of uh, curtail uh, the debate. And sort of, it has this uh, chilling effect, as Malcolm was saying, on, on debate. Uh, or we unduly... Um, associate uh, religious uh, neutrality with issues of constitutional uh, principles. And when there are uh, constitutional uh, principles uh, involved, I think it is fair for the supranational uh, courts uh, to give uh, more uh, of a discretion, more margin of appreciation towards uh, uh, national legislation and uh, national uh, constitutional courts, but often uh, those constitutional principles are not at all at stake. And, and then I think it is important uh, not to um, restrain unduly uh, the role of supranational courts. And it's not giving, about giving the last say to the European Court of Human Rights or the Court of Justice. I see it as uh, in sort of a theories of deliberative democracy as an ongoing process. So the dialogue will go on. Um, and uh, yes, like all of you, I would uh, emphasize a uh, local level, but without uh, any, without idealizing uh, the local level either, uh, because um, it's not a gev given that this dialogue will have taken place at the local level at all. And in, in the employment cases, often the employer actually made sure that there was no uh, dialogue whatsoever at, at the local level. And here again, uh, courts can have a role in making sure that this uh, dialogue uh, can um, re, uh, be reignited. Um, 
so education, um, uh, I, I think uh, that uh, neutrality as uh, bouncing back on, on the excellent presentations we, we had uh, today, uh, neutrality in uh, education is probably more an aspiration uh, than um, something that can perfectly be achieved. Um, and, and that's probably a, a good thing. Um, it doesn't mean uh, we have to uh, give up on neutrality as long as we mean it in this uh, plural uh, as embracing pluralism. Uh, but I agree with the, present, uh, the presentations we had that we have to be aware uh, that it's, it's never uh, perfectly uh, achievable. Um, and the last uh, question, uh, but I look not what was the last question. <laughs> oh yes, concealing. Well, actually, that's uh, something I, I denounced uh, myself, uh, that uh, neutrality uh, often has a concealing uh, effect on, on religion. Um, it, it, again, uh, what is uh, uh, problematic is it, not per se this concealing effect. And uh, Schmidt, I agree that there are uh, probably uh, instances where it might be uh, legitimate and even desirable for uh, people to conceal uh, their uh, religious uh, affiliation. Uh, I would be hesitant to, to draw a sort of a very strict distinction between state and non-state uh, spheres. Uh, like Michael, I, I, we were discussing this over coffee. I, I think that the, the way that we will draw this distinction is in itself very embedded in the national uh, stories of how uh, state and uh, religion have uh, uh, constructed themselves over the year. And I, I see really difficulties in, in, in the UK sometimes in, in drawing the, the distinction and uh, in France in finding non-state spheres. So it's, so it, it's uh, some, uh, an approach which would be more uh, contextual uh, would, would probably have uh, my, my preference rather than to parry uh, principal di divisions uh, as, as a starting point. Uh, but concealing religion is problematic it, when it's done under the guise of uh, an abstract a notion of uh, religious neutrality, because then it is never uh, justified. Um, and that's the problem. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, I, I would love to comment your comments, but uh, no time, definitely no time. But there is some time, sharp time for uh, Reactions or comments or questions from the audience. Take this as a unique opportunity to raise your ideas in the very last session. Yes, Ben, Professor Vermeulen. Thank you. Um, well, I think neutrality is a very important uh, issue. And it is historically extremely important because neutrality has been the solution of the religious civil wars raging in Europe from the 16th century onwards. And uh, uh, the solution that has been taken is that um, there has been a centralization of power in the king and the court and the, and the state, which rises above the fighting parties and to a certain extent is neutral. And that neutrality in, in the beginning is quite uh, vague, quite, quite at a micro level. You have the right to be free in your own head, the prohibition of inquisition, and in your own home. And later on, that neutrality, that partial neutrality has become a more full priority which allows people also to have their own church. And from the 19th century onwards, that has not only been the church, but also organizations in society. So I, I think we should appreciate the worth of neutrality. The demand on the state that on the one hand it is sovereign, but its sovereignty 
is limited. And only through this limitation, it is legitimate. So it's the combination of, on the one hand, there is a central state power, which creates peace, which, which peace can only exist on the basis of pluralism. The state uh, defending pluralism and keeping the uh, religious warring parties aside. So I think that um, when we are talking about neut neutrality, we should uh, also um, uh, link it to um, more or less conjunct conjuncted uh, uh, notions like separation of state and church, notions like pluralism. So we should not deny that historical um, uh, dimension, which is also a very important uh, uh, influential factor when we are studying, for, exam for example, the laïcité in France. And that laïcité has, is one of the aspects which is connected with neutrality and stems from the 19th century battle between church and state. So we, uh, I think in, in, in the historical perspective, neutrality is an institutional principle that is very strongly linked to the neutrality of the state and is a very valuable instrument. So it's, in my, in my view, it's uh, the counterpart of pluralism, the counterpart of also the religious freedoms. Um, as to the hiding issue, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether I agree so much with the hiding. Um, at least from my own functioning as a judge and as a, an advisor to government when it concerns legislation, I, I think it would be very strange if I um, make very much public what my religious or political convictions are. I believe that for certain officials, it is plausible and in my conception necessary that, he, that you try to not hide your religion, but not base your decisions in law and um, in, in, in your advices on religion. So I think it, it, it may be a functional criterion when it comes to those functions which are so vital to the state that you can demand of the person that is in that situation that he steps somewhat beside himself and does not allow his religion to be the main cause of the, the way he, he constructs the law case or the way he advises government. So that are a few of my... Um, uh, yeah, we should definitely come, come, come back to some of your ideas later on, but uh, that will be after after uh, this session. Ilias, and then the last one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief knowing that my question is the only thing that separates us from alcohol. Uh, so, uh, right, in, right in my paper, um, I realized, and I think I mentioned that, that the more I was getting to the problem of mandatory vaccinations and its relationship to freedom of religion and religious anti-discrimination, the more elusive the concept of neutrality became. I had to engage with the, the, the specific reasons why public health has to be protected, the specific aims and the scope of religious freedom and religious anti-discrimination to get to the answers. And I think that many of you today raised similar concerns. Malcolm was just saying how much he dislikes uh, neutrality, and many of you raised similar concerns. Um, so, and it's because perhaps of some of those reasons that some courts have chosen to circumvent the concept of neutrality, just to use Stein's expression, but others have implied the same. Now, I understand the point of judicial strategy here, I don't want to make a slightly different point, ask a slightly more difficult question. So the courts are under a duty to uphold human rights, even when that goes against the will of the majority. Now, given the limitations of neutrality that we discussed today, and given the fact that we know that the concept has been used sometimes to further the exclusion of certain groups, do you think that human rights and constitutional courts are to some extent under a duty 
not to use neutrality or to limit the use of neutrality? And under what circumstances would that be? Right. Yes, thank you all so much. I'll keep it brief. Um, but a thought that came to mind for me relates to um, not so much maybe the theory we've been discussing so far and so eloquently, thank you so much for that, but also just the practical implications of what it means to be neutral and who has the opportunity to be neutral or who gets to be neutral. And I think just, just adding that thought and calling out for reflection on the fact that, at least from my perspective, it seems that neutrality oftentimes is a privilege of the majority. So this question of who gets to be privileged or who, who gets to be neutral, um, and how do we how do we prevent um, this uh, practical consequence that being neutral really only uh, becomes something you can be as a majority, whereas for a minority simply being is already not being neutral. Um, so, of course, this relates to certain religious expressions, certain religious practices that are, are interpreted as symbols, but may just be practices. Um, but also this, this question of, um, for example, something that, that fascinates me, and I'll keep it really short, but the fact that, for example, when we look at judges, we do think that it makes a judge no longer neutral when the judge wears a hijab, wears a headscarf, or wears some sort of religious symbol or political symbol. Um, but we don't look at, at gender and how gender influences the decisions of the judge, or we don't look at race or ethnicity and how that influences. Just coming to say that there are many aspects that influence our life and influence our, um, our view on things, but I think it, it won't happen as often that a white judge is accused of not being neutral in a, in a case dealing with race, whereas perhaps a judge of color would be uh, accused of not being neutral. So just adding that as um, food for thought. Good point. Thank you so much. So uh, let me uh, invite the four panelists to uh, answer briefly some of the, of the questions and also to formulate some final thoughts. Professor Van der Waal. Yes, it's, it's probably to, to ask the question, is religious diversity a specific kind of diversity or is it different from other kinds of diversity, which is an intriguing empirical but also conceptual question. What a, of course, what Ben Vermeer said is true and was true in that specific historical context, and it remains to be true in a sense. But when there is a kind of gestalt switch, and um, I'm coming back to the metaphor of neutral, uh, to being neutral as a sword of a shield. And I think both are in a way uncomfortable. I think neutrality has to, if you want to have a metaphor, kind of an open table in which conversation never can stop because the conversation is done in such a way that the conversation cannot be continued. It's so a process, an attitude, uh, more than a sword or a shield, stricto sensu, I would say. For me, it's related to the notion of tolerance. And tolerance is not just it's your viewpoint, this is mine, we're okay. The, the real tolerance is that you have to bear and even to suffer the idea that your idea might not be the correct one. You are convinced, but there is another idea. And the mere notion of tolerance is that I'm invited to even doubt on my strong beliefs. And the conversation on that table of neutrality or whatever you want to call it has the obligation, I would say a moral obligation, a constitutional obligation, to make sure that the dignity of difference, because in difference there is also a kind of dignity, I'm quoting Jonathan Sachs, the rabbi of Greater London, who wrote an excellent book on that notion of dignity of difference. And this is why I said this is such an important debate, because what we are talking about is what do we need, under what conditions can we accept that neutrality is that useful fiction, because in a way it's a fiction. One of my colleagues in, in Tilburg, who died in that terrible plane crash, MI17, talked about the public interest as a, the general interest as a, as a, as a useful fiction. 
it's a fiction we know, but it's very useful to, to structure and to have a peaceful society. Well, under what conditions, neutrality, you know, how you define it, could be such a um, useful fiction? That is, I think, the question that we ask without or without not having that idea of, well, is it is it a position or is it not a position? But let me stop here again. Thank you. Uh, once again, so many interesting remarks. I'll perhaps engage with your question um, as to the role of the courts in human rights protection. I would say that that is exactly the role of the courts with regards to neutrality. And I still fight the idea that we're talking about neutrality in singular as if it were a single thing. Um, I still think we're talking about the plurality of neutralities. Um, and because we're talking about the plurality of neutralities, it's not up for a judge, judge to construct uh, the specific blend of neutrality that has been chosen by the, the local government, by the school board, by the state. Um, the job of the judge is to look at uh, the question whether or not the uh, the core legal principles have been um, circumvented by that specific blend. And by that, I mean the, the words I started with in the beginning, equal treatment, non-discrimination, impartiality, and seemingly impartiality if we're talking uh, with access to justice, um, as well as core or human rights, knowing that since we're dealing with the plurality of neutralities, that perhaps the specific interpretation of that human right might differ. But that is a job, a job of a judge. And, Avoidance is perhaps too negatively framed because it's not avoiding the question; it is tackling the question when they when that's what the job uh, what, what, what the judge is doing. Thank you. Um, to be brief, um, so much again in, in in what has been said, but you know, are human are human rights bodies under or courts under a duty to limit the use of neutrality? Um, I, again. I would say it simply depends on what, what is being spoken of at the time. If we delete the word neutrality and write in impartiality, in most of the instances we're talking about, when was looking at the judicial function, I think we capture what is actually meant here, that we expect those vested with the, with the privilege of decision making on, on our behalf at all levels to undertake and exercise that task with the seriousness and the dignity and the impartiality that the exit that the granting of them of that function has 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 given them and i think you know the, the, you know, to, you know that, that i think is one of the essence of the if you like the compact that we have within the systems that we have and and and, and when we feel that people are not are acting um, or acting partially and not acting in and not acting impartially then that is the thing that of course really you know really triggers a, a response in us we want to feel that you know the positions that are being advanced are being taken seriously and are being evaluated seriously but the result of impartiality does not need to look like neutrality in terms of what its outcome the process should be neutral as to the the biases with, within the system but the outturn of it Again, um, is neutrality a goal? It goes back to what several of us have argued. It is a tool, to, to, a means to an end, to give greater weight or validity to the to, to the outcome, you know, of the of the process. Um, you know, just turning briefly to some of the other um, remarks, it, it's quite interesting. Again, it goes to this business of what is appropriate in different different countries, different different um, historical traditions and emerging traditions about what is visible or or not. You know, what should a judge wear, for example? Well, there's doubtless you all know in the in the UK they still all wear 17th century court court garb as if they're still trotting out of the um you know the courts of william and mary um you know with their powdered wigs and all the rest of it i kid you not um you you, you know this still is 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 the the case it sort of looks ridiculous but the argument is it is an equalizer a, 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 across all so what does that tell us about what they wear but of course there are exceptions we have judges who wear turbans for example um, in the in 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 the court of appeal because they're seat no one would even think to think that that was improper even though of course it is the most very visible um, symbol of their religious faith their their and, and the traditions out of which they're they're, they're working um, that doesn't seem to pose a problem 
um, that I'm aware of within our judicial polity. I can see it might in others, but that goes back to what we've said before about how these things play out within the traditions of the state itself. The last thing I want to say really is, you know, perhaps a, a big caveat to all our discussions here today that does trouble me somewhat. I don't mean about what we said here today, but these entire debates that we have around this. You know, it, we still look at, the, look at the conventions on human rights, look at the language of Article 9 of the European Convention of everything. It is still conveying an image of religion which basically is voluntarist and one based on personal piety. To use a phrase, said, you know, it starts in the head, then it goes to the home, how further it can go. Well, of course, for many others, in very many other parts of the world, that is not even the beginning of how they understand the concept of religion, not even the content, but the concept of religion. So I am aware that the very way that we indeed even have a discussion about neutrality based on the idea of what the right role, the balancing out this, is actually to the vast bulk, numerically, of religious believers in the world would seem a debate that they couldn't even begin to enter into because it doesn't actually cohere with their understanding of the concept of religion. And, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so really interesting uh, questions on, on the uh, value of uh, religious neutrality uh, from a historical perspective on, on the role uh, and, and limits of uh, religious uh, neutrality in courts and on the difficulties for individuals or, or certain uh, individuals to, to be uh, neutral. Uh, some will find it more difficult than, than others. Um, I. I do not uh, want to uh, refute the, the, the value uh, of uh, religious neutrality from a historical perspective, uh, but the question is whether we can uh, retain uh, some of its value uh, without uh, using the concept, if the concept happens uh, in courts, uh, to have uh, damaging uh, effects. Um, I, see, I see historically historically uh, value in religious neutrality uh, when transp transposed, I mean, in, in a contemporary uh, setting, in this idea of impartiality, and that would uh, address to an extent the, the objection that uh, minority uh, um, traditions might find it more difficult to be neutral. Uh, well, if uh, there's a duty of impartiality on, on the courts and legal actors, then actually uh, this would uh, trigger uh, a duty to uh, intervene to redress uh, systemic disadvantage. So neutrality might not, uh, might actually lead to non-neutral um, uh, policies. Um, so this uh, idea of impartiality uh, is, is important. There's also uh, through re uh, religious neutrality, uh, as you mentioned, this idea of uh, non-interference into uh, religion. And I think this is also something that should be retained, uh, the I this idea to avoid uh, encroachment uh, upon uh, religious uh, spheres, so this idea of separation, uh, which is at the heart of democracy as well between the state and uh, religion. Um, but if we stop uh, there, um, then the conception of religious freedom uh, that we get is purely negative. Uh, we see a religious freedom as exclusively negative liberties uh, that protect individuals or communities against encroachments from the state or even uh, other uh, actors. Uh, but we don't have uh, the, the message that religious freedom can make uh, positive contributions to democracy. To me, this is a gap. Uh, and this is why uh, in, in the framework I proposed in my uh, latest book, I actually decided not uh, to use uh, religious uh, neutrality. Uh, I, I would like courts to do the same, but I can't uh, <laughs> promise that they will follow uh, 
Uh, but uh, so instead, I, I proposed uh, three criteria, uh, and it's, it's not the place here, but I just mentioned them, uh, avoidance, inclusion, and revision. So I keep this idea of avoidance, non-interference, into uh, to make sure there's this uh, separation between the state and religion. Then I'm bringing uh, inclusion to make sure that um, uh, the state does intervene to redress uh, systemic disadvantages if need be, but also the principle of revision, and that goes back to uh, our first uh, roundtable, uh, to uh, counter the chilling effect which um, uh, religious neutrality often uh, has. So the principle of revision in that uh, uh, legal actors are uh, encouraged to constantly revisit uh, legal solutions uh, when new contestations emerge, but also vice versa, uh, uh, citizens um, are encouraged uh, to uh, review uh, their, um, th their positions uh, in light of the overall uh, political uh, framework. Thank you. Wow, again, an exciting, exciting panel. Let us honor those panelists. Applauding, please. Yeah, I have a real problem, 5.30. So that means that we are already running out of time. And I, I prepared, uh, well, Stan prepared the four questions. I, I prepared four final thoughts and recommendations and conclusions. But it will not be fair vis-a-vis um, -vis the time schedule. And we cannot ask the governor to postpone our dinner, can't we? So what, I, what we will do, what, what I could do, what we will do is laid down uh, those thoughts in, in, in an article in the contribution of, uh, of the publication that will come out of, of this uh, session, you know, of this expert meeting. There will be several spin-offs of this session. It's what I, I hate one-shot initiatives. It should be the start of a process on, on rethinking open norms, contested norms, um, and, and making use of the very fruitful ideas exchange of, of views we had during the day. Um, I, will, I will stop here, unfortunately, because it, I would start, I, I wanted to be a little bit provocative in, in, in my final remarks, but that will be for, for a later moment. Uh, but I want to ask you now, Stan, to, to formulate and to give the last words of thanks and the final conclusion. Yes. Thank you, Jan. Well, <laughs> this has been a truly exciting and rewarding day for me, and I hope for you as well. I will be processing the ideas and arguments that we heard today for weeks and months to come, and hope I ever arrive at the end of it. Um, we, we briefly want to address some words of thanks to people uh, to whom thanks are due. First of all, our sponsors, uh, which you've seen on the screen throughout the day. Uh, we extend our warmest thanks to all speakers, discussants, and panelists for their engaged discussion on this important theme uh, that we address today uh, of the relationship between neutrality and religious diversity, both in the public education and in the public sphere more broadly. We're very grateful to our uh, poster presenters who have given us a glimpse into the future of legal research in education law, religious freedom, and human rights law more broadly. Uh, and last but definitely not least, I want to thank my colleagues from the technical staff and from the faculty administrative staff for their invaluable support. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to organize this conference. Now, I now have to close this conference, but we will continue, I am sure, to keep this conversation going together, sitting at an open table. Thank you. We will, we will gather in the, at the lobby of the hotel uh, to go to an, in group, go to the residence of the governor at uh, 6, 6.30. Does that make sense? Yes, 6.30. Okay, see you there. Very thanks. Go see you there. Thanks very much.